Good evening, uh, good morning, and welcome you all to this uh, Journal of Hand Microsurgery webinar on congenital hand difference. Uh, thank you, Dr. Charles Kolkar and the team, Dr. Samir, uh, Dr. Jane, Professor Bhaskaran sir, has been kindly accepted to join this, uh, you know, uh, the first New Year's interesting program. Everybody's you know, choice was to start with the congenital hand, preferably uh, with Dr. Uh, it's nice and privileged to have you uh, today. And uh, we are definitely going to have a great uh, time uh, during this one-hour program. Uh, to start with, uh, let me uh, have uh, Dr. Gold Charles Fletch, to have his talk first, and then probably we can uh, go ahead with the subsequent speakers. First of all, thank you for having us, and I hope this is uh, enjoyable, and I uh, hope there are some questions uh, that we can uh, discuss. Um, my uh, discussion today will be my first discussion today will be on radial deficiency and i'm going to share how we think about the forearm and wrist uh here in st louis missouri in the united states i'm privileged to work at two wonderful hospitals um that approach uh kids a little differently but uh, the bottom line is i have a large volume of patients So a brief overview, uh, we know that children with radial deficiency can be isolated or syndromic. Um, and I've listed a few of the syndromes that we see commonly in the United States, but I recognize that this differs uh, from continent to continent and country to country. Uh, most of our children do have some type of associated anomaly, whether that be a true syndrome or an associated musculoskeletal abnormality. Because, because of that, uh, we do a thorough ex examination both clinically and we often do the listed procedures as well. And that would include clinical examination, echocardiogram, renal ultrasound, radiographs, blood count, and sometimes we do a chromosomal challenge for Fanconi anemia because of the implications of that. We do genetically test some of our children in the United States, uh, but the cost and benefit is not yet clear. So all of our children with radial deficiency are not genetically tested because it's not yet of true benefit here. So I think we are all aware of the Bain classification, uh, which is presented here on the left, which is a one through four classification based on the bony development of the forearm. And what I've added on the right is an extension of that, which includes the type 5, but there's also been an extension uh, distally by Dr. Michelle James and others for a type 0 and a type N, and I'll show a little bit about those. So here are a few x-rays. Uh, we would call this a type 0, so relatively normal forearm, but you can see there is deviation of the wrist and likely an absent scaphoid bone. Um, this we would call a type 1 and a type 2, type 2 being a radius in miniature. I lumped 3 and 4 because often you don't see the proximal radius, which is the only part of the radius to develop in type 3. And so this is a type 3 and 4, and this is a type 5, which we describe in combination with uh, Mary Beth Azaki in Dallas, where you have an ulna and you have a deficient humerus. Uh, this child has TAR syndrome, and you can tell that 
by the fact that the thumb is present. So how do we think about treating the wrist in radial deficiency? And I've listed three main points. The first, and again, I recognize there are cultural differences based on where we are, and there are expectation differences based on our families. And so in the United States, uh, families, <laughs> maybe everywhere, but in the United States, families are very demanding, uh, have high expectations, and there's a sense that something needs to be done. And while we certainly don't let the families dictate our treatment, that is something that we as physicians and surgeons have to address. The second issue is my goal is to improve both the deformity and the appearance. So functionally, I want to improve them, but I also want to improve their appearance. And point three gets to function. Strength, uh, stability of the wrist, and position of the wrist for potential politicization. And I want to try to help improve finger range of motion. So those are the things I go back to as I consider this problem. So briefly, let's go through the different types. So with a type zero, the wrist is radially deviated, but the radius is of normal length, the carpus is deficient, and there are tight radial sided structures. Wrist extension might be limited as well. Again, here's a radiograph. You can see the hypoplastic thumb, the normal radius, but the marked radial deviation. And so when we treat these patients surgically, we release the tight radial sided structures. If there is an ECR, and I say ECR, not ECRB or ECRL, but if there is an ECR, we transpose it centrally, and then we also centralize and shorten the ECU. And here are some pictures of that. I call this ECRB, but probably just an ECR, an isolated single radial sided wrist extensor and we've centralized both of these, and that helps to balance the wrist. And the results of this can be remarkably good. Um, and here's that same child after surgery, before policization. And we shared our results a long time ago. And again, good results. So types one and two, the radius is present but short. The wrist is radially deviated may or may not have dramatic wrist flexion. And so again, we have to choose between tendon balancing and or lengthening the radius to balance the carpus. And so I'm gonna focus briefly in this short discussion on using a fixator. I typically use a unilateral fixator for this. Uh, I'll show some pictures. I cross pin the proximal radius and ulna. And I, we always have to remember there is a lot of cartilage at the end of that radius. And so if we're not careful, if you over lengthen this, uh, the radius will go under or over the carpus. And so to minimize that risk, I pin the carpus to the radius. And so here's a good example of what things look like when I take this approach. So again, you can see that I pin the carpus to the radius. I pin the radius to the ulna to minimize the risk of radial capitellar um, dissociation. And then here we're lengthening. And this can be a very effective treatment. It might have to be done again five, six, seven years later, but usually it's only two lengthenings uh, and the wrist stays balanced. And then for type three and four, I wanna emphasize there is absolutely not a standard pathway. Family interaction is crucial. And I think about four options. The first is watching. And uh, there are different concepts behind this. Uh, sometimes more severe kids are better treated with just observation. Uh, I like the bilobed flap. Uh, which traditionally had been done dorsally, but left an ugly scar and was transitioned to a volar bilobe flap by the folks in Dallas. And I'll show some pictures of that. Uh, we in St. Louis have written and favored centralization uh, with or without distraction. And then a free toe transfer is not typically our approach here in St. Louis. So today in 2021, I rarely centralize alone. And what I mean by that is I do centralize patients but I usually use a pre-centralization distraction. Um, the only time I centralize alone if there's mild deviation and um, because I recognize the growth plate is at risk. Now, one of the papers I'll highlight later by Cotwall, you know, really demonstrated outstanding results uh, with centralization alone. But here's the danger. The danger is if you put too much pressure on the distal ulna physis, you will affect growth. And these numbers from Anthony Sestero and Ann Van Heest demonstrate that. There's also Scandinavian 
literature which supports that concept as well. So we have to be very, very careful. So my general approach is centralization after pre-centralization distraction. I use a ringed fixator. We published a couple of times on this, and essentially what we found is that it makes the centralization easier. You don't have to do anything to the corpus like notch it. It avoids pressure on the physis. And my pearl is go slowly. There's no rush. This is not about bone regeneration. It's about lengthening the soft tissues. Um, and results are good. Uh, but what we know is that over time, the wrist can deviate back into the radial deviation posture. So we slowly uh, stretch the soft tissues. We let things calm down for a few weeks. And then we perform a centralization uh, where we release anything that's tight and we rebalance the dorsal tendons, including the ECU. I really like the ulna osteotomy because it can be one of the most important things to realign the forearm, but I try to avoid shortening the already shortened forearm in this process. So we place an ulna carpal pin, we bury it for six months. Often we come back at that six month interval and perform a polycization. We splint full time for six months. We remove the pin at that six month juncture and then we splint the wrist until skeletal maturity. So what are our expectations? And I wanna be careful of time. I think I have a few more minutes. Uh, we wanna improve alignment. We want a longer forearm hand unit. Hopefully finger motion is better, but one of the primary goals is to put the wrist and hand in a position, a better position to allow polycization. So the bilobe flap is a very different approach where it's a soft tissue release without a centralization. And it rebalances the skin and soft tissues. It's a straightforward procedure. And I emphasize this, we emphasize this in children with ulnar prehension. And this is a video that I borrowed from Scott Oishi at Texas Scottish Rite uh, that shows what ulnar prehension is. And so this child is functioning with the ring and small finger alone. She doesn't use the index and middle finger. So that's important for two reasons. Uh, one, you don't want to rigidly put the wrist over too far. And two, she's probably not a great candidate for a polycization. So here's how we do a bilobe flap. I'm not going to belabor this. And it provides a nice scar and improved alignment of the wrist. The last thing I'll say is that fusion of the wrist is not a negative. It can be a really good option for the skeletally mature or approaching skeletal maturity. And so we reported this many years ago and demonstrated improved alignment and appearance and function. But you have to be about 11 years of age for that distal ulna physis to be mature enough for a fusion. Lastly, I want to talk about ulnar lengthening. This is a child, again, with uh, TAR syndrome, with only, really only um, an, an ulna, not really a humerus. And so it can be an option. Typically, we consider this in the adolescent patient, but complications are very, very high. Two articles to highlight. This article uh, from our friends in Sweden demonstrated that adults can have really good hand function and Functional tests such as grip, pinch, forearm length, and motion are more important than radial deviation posture. So severe deformity may cause an appearance issue, but function can be very good. And the second article, uh, which again, I think is really important, and if you haven't read it, I, I encourage you to, by Dr. Cotwall and others on comparison of surgical treatment and non-operative management for radial longitudinal deficiency. So this is from 2011, uh, but it's a really important contribution to literature that showed centralization helps function. So my take home messages are treatment of the wrist and radial deficiency requires a patient centered approach. There's no one size fits all. There's no one standard treatment for everyone. And the factors we consider are how severe the deficiency is, risk mobility, unilateral versus bilateral, and how the child uses the fingers for function. So I wanna say thank you for, uh, for joining us. And I will turn it back over and stop my screen share. Thank you, Dr. Charles. As amazing as always, I've read all your articles about the congenital hand difference, and of course, it's all amazing. Thank you. Um, and then we'll have the discussion at the end. Uh, we'll go with the second talk 
uh, with Dr. Lindley. Uh, if she's ready, uh, I can make her as a presenter. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, you can start sharing your screen. Go ahead, Anit. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to share. Yep. Set. Wrong screen, sorry. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this uh, welcome this evening, and I will be speaking on five uh, reasons for less than five digits. Kind of more of an intro. Um, so why is it important to make a diagnosis? So um, a lot of the diagnoses that I'll kind of speak on, so the five reasons, are associated with conditions that are important to identify. And so um, we think it's very important, you know, as a hand surgeon, it kind of gives us one moment to uh, be able to uh, provide a diagnosis and um, help sort of identify conditions that could potentially affect a child's entire life. But also, there's a role for genetic counseling. And so oftentimes we engage in genetic counselors to help give in parents information with regards to um, additional children, what their risk of having a similar condition. So providing information for families is very important. Um, it gives them um, the words to kind of discuss in a framework to put these uh, diagnoses in and the condition and why this, why their child doesn't have all these digits. And then there's also guilt. When children are born without five fingers, a lot of times there's a lot of parental guilt on why their kids are not perfect um, in that typical sense. And so this really helps to give them some real information to take home and then also helps us with treatment planning. So when I start thinking diagnosis, for me, classification, I have to put it into a framework. So I just wanted to kind of go over this a little bit. So historically, can, the congenital hand was um, diagnosed or classified with regards to Swanson's classification. This was then modified by the IFSSH. Um, and then subsequently, it was really a, an, a great change in sort of the way we think about things. Uh, Kirby Oberg, Paul Mansky, and Dr. Tonkin really took developmental biology and applied that to congenital hand and put that into a framework and thought about it more with regards to biology and then how the hand looked. And so it helped us kind of change the way we thought and how we classified. So they developed the OMT classification, O for Oberg, M for Mansky, and T for Tonkin. And this is sort of, it's been subsequently modified, but in general, I just wanted to present this. We use this every day when we see kids and we put um, kids into this uh, framework. So. Um, so the larger categories are malformations and then deformations where you have um, something that the hand was growing normally and then had a deformation and then dysplasia, which is typically abnormal size and shape uh, and increase um, in uh, some tissue. And then why is that important too? I think in addition to communicating with families and providing them a framework, it's really important for research purposes. It provides us a common language. Um, and so a little plug here, um, Dr. Goldfarb um, in St. Louis here, and then Dr. Bay in Boston worked together um, to develop this multi-center registry to help us sort of get better ideas with regards to epidemiology and then outcomes. And so right now we have 10 centers and it's great just to increase our numbers to be able to study these. So get to the specifics. So we've already heard a little bit about the risk in radiological deficiency, but that's our first one of uh, no re um, or five reasons less for than less than five. Incidence is one in 100,000. So it's bilateral in about half of the cases. And this is a result to, I won't get too much into the actual um, development of biology, but the ZPA is what we think um, this insult comes um, to, um, to develop radial longitudinal deficiency. So this is really the one that's associated with other conditions that we really pick out. So the known, very common associated conditions are, um, we've got an association which is vactral, so vertebral anomalies, anal atresia, cardiac anomalies, tracheoesophageal fistula, and renal anomalies, and then the limb anomalies. So this is one where um, the cardiac part, the tracheoesophageal, these are things that will affect the child's life. And so we're able, able to sort of help pick these out. 
TAR is another one. It's an autosomal um, recessive thrombocytopenia absent radius. So something we um, do check for that. And then holt orum, which is autosomal dominant, which is a cardiac anomaly, either VSD or ASD, and also can be conduction abnormalities associated with the limb deformity. And then Fanconi's anemia. It's a less common, but autosomal recessive trait. It's an aplastic anemia that can be fatal. So being able to identify this early can help um, actually save a child's life. So getting a bone marrow transplant will actually um, increase their lifespan. So for these kids, all of these get a medical workup when we see them. So we do consider a medical geneticist, um, but we really send them, we send them for their CBC, their renal ultrasound, cardiac echo, and then we do um, testing for Fanconi's with the chromosomal breakage or the DEV analysis. So we do know kids who have more severe deformity have a higher likelihood of a syndrome and greater than 90% who have an absent radius have a syndrome. And then also bilateral have a higher risk of a syndrome. So we do think it's important we do test all these children. Now going a little bit onto classification, both the forearm and the hand and thumb have classifications. So for the Blaine and Klug did the forearm classification with increasing um, deformity and severity of radial dysplasia. And then for the thumb, we'll hear more about that from Dr. Trahan, but um, increasing severity of hypoplasia of the thumb um, was classified by Buck Gramco and then Dr. Mansky at the critical division of 3A and 3B. So briefly here, so thinking about treatment um, of these, so form and wrist, we heard a lot about that, so I won't even go into that. This is one of our girls who had bilateral deformity, and you can see we treated her left side and we had not yet treated her right. And then thumb, re thumb treatment, either reconstruction of the hypophosphate thumb or pulsization to provide a thumb uh, and a hand who has a, a minimally functioning thumb or no thumb. So ulnar longitudinal deficiency is the next. So this is an oligodactyly. This is deficiency of the other side of the forearm and the hand. It's less common than radial dysplasia, about one-tenth is common. 25% are bilateral, and it's usually sporadic. With this, there are not the internal um, conditions that we see with radial longitudinal deficiency, but there's more musculoskeletal association. So there can be associated with fibular dysplasia, proximal ephemeral focal deficiency, um, and then there's variable involvement of the ulna. So the thumb is almost always present, but can be variably involved, and 85% of ectrodactyly. Looking briefly here at the classification, once again, um, Bain classified the forearm. Um, there's a pretty strong history sort of um, with these classifications. And then Dr. Mansi classified the hand. He did it really based on function. So his classification had to do with the first web. Um, so the more involvement, you had more narrowing of that first web. And that really does associate with function. So treatment for ulnar longitudinal deficiency, the forearm. I will say most of these kids, we don't do much at all for the forearm. They are incredibly functional. These are the kids, it looks like their, their arm is curved. It looks like their hand is kind of pointing backwards, but their shoulder motion is usually fantastic. So they're able to get their arm in motion very well. Every once in a while, we'll do a closing wedge osteotomy of their, um, of their the bone in the arm if they have a synostosis that causes a lot of curvature and we think it will add to function. We don't do this to, typically for cosmetic to, for cosmetic reason. For the hand, we'll do syndactyly reconstructions. And we've noticed a lot of these kids with more um, severely affected hands um, will have a thumb that's within the plane of the hand. And so very frequently, we'll do a rotational osteotomy of the thumb metacarpal um, to pull that thumb out of the hand to allow for better pinch. Then we have cleft hand. So we've done radial and ulnar longitudinal deficiency. This is more of a central deficiency, and this is the cleft hand. And so here are some examples of those. So the cleft hand, you can have simply a central cleft, or it can then progresses in severity to um, losing digits and then having a two-digit hand or even a monodactylous hand. So it usually preserves or it does preserve the ulnar digit, whereas in ulnar longitudinal deficiency, the thumb is preserved. So that's how those two are different. However, sometimes um, seeing um, a hand, you have to kind of decide if you have one digit, is it a thumb or a small finger? And sometimes that becomes a question. But no nubbins are seen in the cleft hand. So the cleft hand, we um, believe, is about one in 100,000. If it's unilateral, it's typically sporadic. If it's bilateral, it's often autosomal dominant. And there's also a high incidence of foot involvement, around 30%. Once again, looking at classification, so Dr. Mansky really liked the thumb, and so for him, once again, it had to do based on the thumb index web space. 
Um, and that was a classification. It is, we use it very frequently. It has to do more with function. And then Ogino's classification had to do with number of digits. I think that one's a really good one for communicating. So if you're looking at a cleft hand to communicate with someone about what the hand looks like, being able to identify the number of fingers remaining or the number of missing fingers is really great for helping to classify and communicate. So for the cleft hand, Dr. Adrian Flatt made this very famous comment about the cleft hand. He was our, he's kind of the godfather of congenital hand, that it's a functional triumph, but a social disaster. This is a hand that works very well, no matter what it looks like. It, it, it works well. You have this deep cleft. It's very obvious, however, and it's oftentimes a social disaster. Um, so our goals with our treatment doesn't necessarily, it, it, changes where the function in the hand is. We're trying to maintain the function, but we narrow the cleft and then widen the first web. So while most kids, if they have a deep cleft, they use that cleft like a first web space. So we try to shift that function back to the first web and it makes the hand have more of a normal appearance. Now we have symbrachydactyly. So this is not one of the longitudinal deficiencies. So with symbrachydactyly, sporadic and non-genetic, and it is unilateral. However, we've seen a cohort of kids with bilateral, but that's sort of a separate group. It's typically unilateral. One in 10,000, not associated with any internal cardiac, renal issues, but can be associated with colons nominally, um, absence of the sternal head of the pectoralis major, or even a chest wall deformity, or can have some lacking even chest ribs. So why do we think some brachydactyly occurs? We think this has to do with during the time of development that there's a lack of vascular inflow. So the inflow is needed to supply the progress zone. So in the developing limb, the progress zone helps to lead the growth of the arm. And without this, you have a loss, the cellular pro proliferation fails, and you have this insufficient mesoderm level, which is beneath the ectoderm. And so we think this is sort of the, the philosophy is this sub um, clavian artery supply disruption sequence, which was termed by um, Bavlik and Weaver, and created this concept of this mesoderm minus hand, that there was some insult that blocked the blood flow out. So you're lacking sort of the underlying tissue to create the limb, but you still have those nails and distal um, phalanx tufts, as you can see in this picture to the right. So classification is in brachydactyly. So you have the short finger type, which is the least severe. You can see that in the top picture. Central deficiency, which is the what was historically known as the atypical cleft. It is different than the cleft hand, and you can see that at the bottom left picture there. Um, there's no big central V, and you do have a little nubbins. A monodactyl type is just a thumb, and then the paramelic type is where there's no hand, and it can be at different levels. There's sometimes little nubbins or nails still on the, the truncated end of the limb. So operative intervention for symbrachydactyly, this is all very brief, obviously. So to us, it has to do mainly with function. So if there's a single digit, oftentimes doing a vascularized toe to provide another digit to pinch can be very helpful. Um, some people prefer doing the non-vascularized phalanx from a toe. We don't do that, but we've done it a few times, but we don't do that often. You can also lengthen a metacarpal to provide pinch or grasp. Um, rotational osteotomies, once again, sometimes that thumb is within the plane of the hand, and so doing an osteotomy to rotate around to provide pinch can be helpful. And then obviously um, syndactyly reconstruction, especially for the short finger symbrachydactyly. And then this is our last diagnosis, so the amniotic constriction band. So this is a constriction band syndrome, uh, but it isn't really a syndrome, so we kind of hold back from that terminology as much. Two theories on kind of why we think this could have developed both. There's the extrinsic versus intrinsic theory. There's a really good paper um, that Dr. Goldfarb contributed to um, to have all the full details. But uh, I think most people sit in the camp of the extrinsic theory where there are strands asserted the placental membrane that detach and then wrap around um, the limbs and the digits. And this can cause amputations, constriction rings, and even syndactyly. Um, so it is associated with oligohydramnios, but most moms have no risk factors. There's no genetic association that we are aware of. And it usually involves greater than one extremity. I can't think of a single child I've seen where there's only one extremity involved. So that does help us make a diagnosis. Almost every kid that walks into our office has this diagnosis from their primary doctor, from their pediatrician that they see. Um, but very few actually have amniotic constriction pain. We think it's about one in 15,000. So the clinical appearance, you have 
Finished it's syndactyly, where you have a hole between sort of proximal and the skin has welded together. Amputations, other constriction rings, and you can get some bony overgrowth. So our operative indications, um, so you can see on this hand here, we, uh, if there's some distal edema or really deep bands, oftentimes we'll excise the band, either primarily closed to make it smooth or do Z-plasties to break up the scar. You can do that on the fingers, the wrist, or the legs. Um, and then also, here's an example of that fenestrated syndactyly, releasing that fenestration, and then also doing, sometimes you have to still do syndactyly to drop the web spaces down. So once again, this is all to do with function. Uh, take home points. So the five causes for less than five digits, radial longitudinal deficiency, ulnar longitudinal deficiency, cleft hands and brachydactyly, and then amniotic constriction band. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brilli, for your wonderful talk. Um, it was really amazing. A few quick words before you know, we shift to Dr. Samir. Uh, you can uh, make the slides I mean, uh, ready. Uh, we have discussions um, uh, happening in the chat. So probably a uh, few questions can be asked at the end. And we can go ahead with all the presentations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Linda, again. Um, uh, she is a pediatric hand surgeon and associate professor in the Washington University of Medicine. Um, she has been, uh, you know, uh, published more than 60 review articles. And then um, she's now working in a research methodology about the cost analysis factor, the uh, no, uh, congenital uh, problems. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, we have uh, Samir uh, uh, to talk about uh, the next topic and then followed by uh, the uh, Dr. Charles who is going to uh, speak about the syndactyly. So we thank you. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Samir. Can you uh, see my slides and uh, hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I hope everyone and their families is staying safe and well amidst this uh, global pandemic. I chose to talk about hypoplastic thumb uh, because I think this is a condition that I find very interesting, as well as one that uh, I think we can really help patients with substantially. Uh, before we jump into the thumb itself, it's important to take a step back and remember that Patients with hypoplastic thumb uh, can have associated conditions, and this has been touched on previously, but this is a series uh, of about 100 patients in which they noted uh, that a high proportion of patients had bilateral thumb involvement, radial longitudinal deficiency, and 86% had some other anomaly. And so when I initially evaluate these patients, um, my focused exam on the thumb obviously will include things like looking at the appearance of the thumb, the size, the position, atrophy of the femur muscles and absence of creases at the flexion or extension surfaces, uh, assessment of first web space flexibility, assessment of MCP joint stability, assessment of strength of the thumb, uh, as well as function of the thumb in terms of pinch and grasp, but also then uh, a clinical and as needed radiographic assessment of both upper extremities, and then ruling out any associated conditions, which Dr. Wall touched on. And I have a similar approach. I generally refer to these patients to genetics because the screening tests required are uh, out of my area of expertise as an orthopedic surgeon. In terms of uh, evaluation of the thumb, things that we oftentimes will look for and try to evaluate for will include things like atrophy of the femur muscles or small uh, thumb size compared to the contralateral size as pictured here. Uh, there can be deviation of the thumb uh, in the coronal plane as well as absence of flexion or extension creases if there's an abnormal inter connection between the flexor and extensor tendons, known as pollux abductus. In this picture here, you can see a thumb that's uh, obviously hypoplastic, but also there's a tightening or a narrowing of the first web space, which is an important consideration we'll touch on later. The most common pattern of MCP joint uh, instability is pictured here, where there's uh, insufficiency of the ulnar collateral ligament, but uh, relative uh, stability on the radial side. And then in this picture, you can tell by just looking at the thumb, you know, on the left, we're looking at the type 3B, and on the, on the right, we're looking at the type 4. Uh, but you can tell that the index finger is just trying to rotate over, widen from the middle finger, and uh, and rotate, as you can see in this finger, almost acting like a thumb. So if you were to hand this child a pencil or an object, uh, he or she would inevitably grasp it between these two digits, not using the thumb at all. 
In terms of classification, um, the classification was initially described by Dr. Blout uh, from one through five, one being basically normal structural thumb in terms of skeletal and soft tissue components, but just smaller. Type two would include narrowing of the first web space, atrophy of the intrinsic muscles of the thumb, the thenar muscles, and instability of the MCP joint, most commonly on the ulnar side. Type three would include uh, add to that extrinsic deficiencies of FPL and EPL, for example, as well as a hypoplastic metacarpal. And then that was later subdivided by Dr. Mansky into a an B subtype with A uh, indicating a stable, stable CMC joint, excuse me, and uh, B indicating an unstable CMC joint. Uh, and that uh, it oftentimes can be a, a helpful uh, uh, differentiator in terms of treatment. And then type four would be a floating thumb where there's really just a soft tissue stalk there and no skeletal connection between the thumb and the rest of the hand. And five is a four finger uh, hand with uh, no thumb. So in terms of treatment options for hypoplastic thumb, I mean, I think there's really three big buckets. One bucket would basically be doing nothing. Obviously patients with very mild involvement in type one, that's something that we would consider uh, or we would always consider. Uh, in other population of patients that have uh, Considered the sin as in older patients. Uh, I've had patients come in who are in their teenage years or young adult years who have either just four fingers and no thumb or a, a type three D thumb, for example. And when I offer and tell them about what a pulsation may involve or a reconstruction may involve, they look at me like I have two heads and run out the door. And so I think that uh, reconstruction, uh, sorry, some of these surgeries that we have are most successful in younger patients. And I've been underwhelmed sometimes in the older patients. Certainly older patients who have not had surgery and have adapted are oftentimes amenable to no treatment at all. Um, in a young patient though that comes in with a type two or three A thumb, I typically will recommend a reconstruction. We'll talk about what that involves shortly. There is definitely a wealth of literature on type three B and even type four thumb reconstruction with vascularized bone grafts, typically out of the scope of my practice. And that's there's a lot of geographic cultural and societal variability there. And so it certainly may be an area for discussion later, uh, but uh, typically not in the scope of my practice, unless the patient is very strongly, uh, but the patient's family is very strongly in favor of trying to maintain five digits. And then for the type three, B, four, and five thumbs in my practice, typically uh, we do an index finger pulse session. So reconstruction uh, involves really three components, uh, deepening of the first web space, an opponent's plasty to power the thumb, and reconstruction of the collateral ligaments. My favorite technique for the first web space is a four flap Z plasty. It's simple for uh, flaps that uh, sort of as pictured here, A, B, C, D, which when you uh, release becomes C, A, D, D, like Cadbury with chocolate. And uh, basically, you uh, have excellent access to the ulnar aspect of the MCP joint as well. And uh, so I find this to be excellent for exposure, easy to do, easy to design, and uh, provides good access if uh, reconstruction of the collateral is required. For the opponent's plasty, uh, my preferred technique is FDS uh, for the ring finger as the source. And this is an outstanding technique article written by doctors Kozen and Azaki. Uh, and I basically call it a very similar uh, version of this technique with an incision at the base of the ring finger to uh, isolate the FDS, an incision at the wrist to then harvest the FDS to the ring finger using the FCU uh, as a pulley. The goal being uh, perhaps maybe making the pulley a little bit more proximal just so you're mirroring the vector of the APB, and then an incision at the radial aspect of the MCP joint where you're suturing it to the APB. Um, the other advantage of using the FDS for your reconstruction is that you can use a slip for your ulnar collateral ligament uh, reconstruction as pictured here. And, uh, and then these patients are pinned and casted for four weeks. And then those are removed at four weeks and they're put in a splint and start therapy at that time. Outcomes as described uh, in this paper for this technique from Texas Scottish Rite uh, have been quite good in terms of improving function strength and uh, range of motion. Uh, for patients with more severe involvement of the um, of hypoplastic thumb, uh, pulsization is uh, another excellent option and uh, the one I typically favor, as I had mentioned. Many master surgeons have described their techniques in, in great detail. Uh, these are just a few examples. Dr. Azaki has a, a 
certain videos outlining the history of the procedure, the need for the procedure, and the post-operative course for this procedure, both for patients and a separate video for surgeons. Her incision is widely used. Dr. Kozin uh, has step-by-step -step sort of description of his, his, his uh, technique for this procedure in Green's hand surgery, which uh, in the United States at least is the sort of the most widely used textbook in hand surgery. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Buck Ranko has also described uh, historically uh, this technique and has a very different incision, which I've also seen utilized uh, by Dr. Light and others. My version of this procedure is very similar to Dr. Zaki and Dr. Kozen's. Basically, uh, it, briefly designing the skin incision, identifying the dorsal veins, elevating the interosseous muscle insertions, uh, and then releasing the transverse and metacarpal ligament. Osteotomizing the metacarpal and shortening the metacarpal uh, based on a preoperative template of uh, length, uh, usually between 20 and 22 millimeters, being an epiphysiodesis, uh, suturing the MCP joint hyperextension, fixing the metacarpal with a K wire, rebalancing those interosseous muscles by suturing them to the lateral bands to recreate the APB and adductor, respectively, and then closing. They uh, this is like a type 4 thumb that we did recently, and just sort of the K-wire. We put this patient in a cast, we leave the tip of the thumb exposed, we admit the patient over the night for a vascular check, and then discharge the patient, see them back four weeks later for the cast and pin to come out. I counsel parents that we're not making a thumb so much as taking the index finger, repositioning it, and, uh, and rebalancing it to act like a thumb. It's going to be a little bit different in terms of the size and the strength. And so it's important for setting expectations. I'm not sure in India whether these cartoon characters are popular, but in the United States, uh, all of these very popular cartoon characters and almost every cartoon character has three fingers and a thumb, and I bet no one ever noticed. Uh, and that's just because it's, it can look very natural. So from, a, from the standpoint as a congenital hand surgeon, this can be a very rewarding procedure in terms of uh, restoring aesthetics, uh, restoring function and optimizing aesthetics. And uh, and I bet nobody knew that you had three fingers in the thumb. One thing I have noticed in my patients, this is one of my patients as well. Uh, you know, sometimes when we really work to preserve those dorsal veins and the associated fat around them, there sometimes can be a little bit of a bump. This patient's now like three years out from surgery, and that bump hasn't resolved. Doesn't bother parents or the child, but bothers me every time I see him. In terms of long-term uh, functional results for this uh, procedure, they've been published by Dr. Mansi, another uh, legend in the, this space. But uh, you know, some of these findings I sort of underlined, underlined the key things are um, sometimes the index finger is going to be stiff. And so certainly when you pulse it, it'll remain stiff. You're taking the interosseous muscles, the dorsal and vulvar interosseous muscles, and turning them into an adductor and APB. Uh, those muscles aren't meant to those functions, and so there's going to be an element of weakness as well but improvements in function are uh, universally seen in general. So I just touched on uh, you know, the things that uh, factor into my practice, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg. This is a, an area with lots of research. There's other ways to reconstruct the thumb. You can use different sources like the ADM, the paper. There are many variations in pulsization. I don't, for example, shorten uh, or the flexor and extensor tendons, whereas none of those that has been described and some people do that routinely. And then obviously the type 3B and type 4 thumb, there's lots of uh, variation worldwide in terms of how these are treated. And there's a wealth of literature on vascularized bone grafts from the second toe, for example, to reconstruct those thumbs in young children. So thank you very much. I left my email address, but obviously I'm happy to answer questions now, but anytime, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Samir, uh, we have um, our past president, uh, Dr. Baskaranand. Uh, uh, he's our uh, professor and uh, he has been a mentor to all of uh, young hand surgeons regarding the congenital hand problems. So he has been a pioneer in doing all policy sessions and other procedures, which you have learned a lot of things from him. So we have here, uh, Dr. Baskaranand, sir, uh, could you comment on a few words about this before we move to the final speaker? Yeah. Okay. Nice. Only thing is, I have a doubt why K wire is used routine or because Bagramko himself was not using it. I, I don't use it at all. For fixation of the after polycization, I saw a K wire there. 
Yes, I always use a K-Wire. I find it, uh, I just find it helpful and easy to do uh, to just help balance it. I have seen sutures done, and uh, I certainly think that's certainly reasonable to use sutures through the bone. Uh, but I find it very easy to temporarily stabilize the bone and then suture around it, and I just find it faster. And then since I cover it with a cast uh, and take off the cast and the KOR at the same time, it doesn't really introduce any inconvenience for the patient. That's nice. Right. Different approach in St. Louis. We, we also do not use K-wires. We simply use suture. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Shane from uh, China, uh, who has been a very, you know, aspiring uh, uh, hand surgeon, who does a lot of uh, congenital hand works. Uh, Shane, uh, could you have any comments on uh, thoughts about this before we move to the final speaker? Oh. Yeah, Dr. Shane, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, I, I can hear you. I, I didn't like to hear your question. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was just mentioning about uh, you in the panel list that you have been a young, uh, you know, uh, very aspiring uh, hand surgeon doing a lot of uh, congenital hand uh, surgeries. Uh, your comments and thoughts about the uh, topics and uh, any questions to the panelists here. Oh. Um, Today is uh, um, it's a talk about uh, um, hyperplastic thumb. So um, in um, I look at the pictures of a uh, cartoon and. Then and uh, Chinese parents uh, keep the five fingers. So, uh, what do you think about it to keep five fingers to uh, use a microsurgery uh, technique? Doctor, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I definitely am uh, aware of that sort of cultural the cultural importance of maintaining five fingers and uh, we I've taken care of patients from uh, China or who are of Chinese descent in my practice and so certainly if that's what they want that's what we'll do but in general if there's no cultural preference and for people um, the majority of the patients that see my practice there is not so much of a cultural preference to maintain five fingers at all costs then uh, the dividing line between 3A and 3B is typically where I'd recommend policy session. But obviously, if five fingers is extremely important, then then I would certainly consider reconstruction. But my experience in that area is extremely limited because it just isn't there in my patient population. Perhaps uh, doctors Goldfarb and Wall may have a different experience. But... Uh, thank you. And um, um, China, um, Hospital of Jisutan Hospital, Dr. Sunnington, and they. Um, their team do some um, many pa patients uh, use a microsurgery technique. So um, their um, their work was uh, published in GHS. So uh, do you think this is a good technique for the um, Asian parents to? Mm. Do you ever do? Do you ever do this? Uh, uh, keep five figures uh, surgery. Um, you know, sometimes we will reconstruct a small thumb um, in a three B or even a four, but that is really rare for us. Um, I just wrote a paper with Dr. Kawabata from Japan talking about reconstruction of the 3B. And um, it's just not common, as Dr. Trehan said. It, in our population, uh, we believe function can be better and appearance is tolerated with three fingers and a thumb. So we just don't do it very commonly here. Yes, us. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tigan. Uh, it was a wise, uh, nice talk. Uh, Dr. Tigan was, you know, is an orthopedic surgeon uh, in the Department of Hand and Proximity Surgery from uh, uh, Sur Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. He has been uh, experienced in a uh, lot of congenital hand anomalies and other uh, 
hand and wrist surgeries. So thank you. Uh, now we will move on to the uh, final speaker, in the Charles Goldberg. His last uh, speak uh, talk about the SIND actually. Uh, before uh, you know, he's going to be give his talk. Let me have a few uh, words about him. The moment I uh, just emailed him about this uh, symposium and webinar, he was very much, you know, um, uh, very swiftly he accepted this the invitation, and uh, was very uh, you know thankful uh, in uh, you know accepting this and making this uh, happening event, uh, especially a topic of very interest. Um, he has actually you know uh, been the pioneer in uh, congenital hand surgery. He's been there for more than 19 years of uh, work in uh, congenital hand congenital hand problems. Uh, moreover, he has edited more than 30 books, been a pioneer in writing books for the American Society of Hand Surgery. Uh, to my understanding, uh, uh, he also is the uh, the um, uh, co-founder and the manager of COULD, he pronounces Cool uh, Registry, a multicentric uh, database for ch uh, children with uh, congenital anomalies. So far, they have registered more than 3,500 children with congenital anomalies, a huge number uh, where uh, it's really fantastic to see all the uh, results and the follow-up. Um, thank you once again for uh, joining us, and we'll move to the final talk uh, of Charles about the syntax. Please go. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, and and I will say that I responded quickly because I feel passionately about taking care of kids with these birth anomalies, and I'm thrilled that uh, we have good participation. I know that in in you know in your country it's. Uh, it's on a Saturday night, um, but this is this is one of the great, you know, there's a lot of terrible, terrible things about our pandemic, but the use of this type of conference uh, is really a wonderful thing. And so I hope it continues. All right, one second. All right, I would like to speak uh, briefly uh, on syndactyly reconstruction and again to share our thoughts, but also to give some historical perspective on this process. So the literature is helpful on the treatment of syndactyly, but in reality, it is mostly a series of case reports and different surgeons techniques, which honestly in our day and era doesn't help terribly much. And so we have limited outcomes, we have mixed populations, and so interpreting the literature is tough. And we all know that there are different types of syndactylies, complete uh, or incomplete, so going to the tip of the finger or not, skin involvement only or bony as well, and then complicated associated with other conditions. There's a few more examples. Um, the center in the, is an ulnar deficiency syndactylized hand. And then on the top right, as Dr. Wall referenced, that is a fenestrated syndactyly seen with um, amniotic constriction band. So how do I think about treatment? First of all, I think we would all agree that the goal is to create a normal web space. And the normal web space has about a 40 to degree dorsal to palmar direction of your skin. So if you look at your own hand, you can see that. And that is our goal, to recreate as close to normal as possible. And I think we would all agree that the zigzag incisions are the best approach distally, except in Apert syndrome, where we know there's no IP joint motion, we don't have to worry about contractures developing, so a straight line incision is 100% okay. So the primary disagreement among surgeons is what type of flaps do you use to recreate the commissure? Uh, do you use skin graft? And how should you approach this? And so there have been a number of reports. Um, this one on the left is um, Adrian Flatt's general technique, uh, which is our general preferred technique. But you can see many other techniques have been described far more than I have on this screen. And all are you know, helpful and may work for the surgeon that described them. Probably the two most common flaps for the commissure are the two triangular flap, flaps, one dorsal, one volar, or the dorsal rectangular flap, again, first described by Bauer, but then popularized by flat, and that is our approach. And again, the most important thing 
is doing what we can to avoid web creep. There are here are a couple early articles which describe results. Uh, the first one was a techniques article, so not high quality literature, but really a large number of syndactylies treated, and they found better results with dorsal rectangular flaps. But the Percival and Sykes article really didn't find a major difference based on the flap. This article, I believe, is really interesting. Um, it is about 10 years old. It looked at CT finite element modeling. And the lesson I took away is straight line or linear scars at the base of that flap are problematic and can increase tension and therefore presumably increase creep. And so we approach it to avoid a straight line. And I hope you can see my cursor. So I create a little indentation here and a matching indentation here. Uh, but you can also reverse that. Dr. Wall does it the other way where there's a distal facing uh, incision here. But this is my basic skin incision, which has been very helpful for me. Skin grafts have been talked about for the last 40 years. Uh, we know the problems with skin grafts. First of all, full thickness grafts are utilized to minimize um, contraction, uh, but they discolor over time. They can be hair bearing. I do use skin grafts on occasion. I typically take my skin graft from the antecubital crease which has a good color match and is not typically hair bearing skin and is on the same extremity that I'm working on. I do not use groin skin um, anymore. But there are other techniques, including these three, to minimize or avoid the need for skin grafts. The technique I have used on occasion, don't regularly use anymore, was described by Sharif um, and brought that dorsal skin more distally and more volarly. I like this technique, but what I've seen over time is that flap can creep back dorsally and parents don't like the appearance of that. But there are three principles to a graphless technique. First, you have to bring new skin into that space. Second, you want to decrease the circumference of each digit and deflat to do that. And then you want to close loosely. So here's an example of that Sharif flap, and you can see how proximal and dorsal uh, that flap is, and that's part of the problem because it creates an unsightly scar, at least for some kids. But it can look really nice, at least initially, and if it doesn't shift over time, it can be a really good outcome. And the last thing I want to emphasize is, at least in the United States, uh, there is an option, and certainly not just in the United States, because it was originally described from Italy by Dr. Landy, um, the use of something called hyaluronic acid scaffold. So this is a matrix that is used instead of skin grafting. Uh, in our country, it's relatively inexpensive, um, and it saves a lot of time in the operating room, and we've had outstanding results. So these, this is the original paper from Landy uh, in 2014 with two-year follow-up and good results. One uh, patient had an infection uh, requiring removal and skin grafting, uh, minimal web creep in some of the patients, but good pigmentation, et cetera. So we looked at the same thing because, you know, there was only one report in the literature and we wanted to examine our own results. We started doing this, uh, I believe in 2015 or 2016 at the latest. Um, and so this is our primary technique. So we still create the commissural flap. We still do the zigzag incisions, but the deficits in the skin are addressed with the dermal substitute. And we've had really good results as well. So we reported on 21 webs. Uh, 16 of those had no web creep. Two had minimal creep. Importantly, three did have notable creep. So that's not ideal, but we've modified our techniques somewhat. And all other measures were satisfactory. What's not reported, because it didn't exist in the patients we reported on, was occasionally you see a hypertrophic granuloma. So abundant kind of beefy red tissue at the site. And that can be treated effectively, but it can slow down the healing. So here's an example. Um, again, you can see the same basic flap. And then what you see is the white is a silicone layer on top of the hyaluronic acid matrix. And usually there's only two pieces of this uh, matrix, but in this case, there were three. Here's an outcome from one patient where you can't even, you know, there's no visible evidence and you see a nice commissural flap.
Lastly, I'd like to briefly mention synonychia, so the conjoined nails. Uh, this was described uh, by Buck Gramco, uh, and Buck Gramco's technique uh, is very helpful. Watson has written on this, and there's all kinds of different techniques. Um, this is what we do. We call it the flag and pennant, similar to what Buck Gramco described, where again, this portion of the flap, and actually sometimes we make it a little bit longer, covers this inside portion of this finger. So it creates a lateral nail fold for this finger. And the pennant flap covers the inside portion of this finger, creating the lateral nail fold. And this has to be really carefully done. And I would say for syndactyles, this is the most technically demanding part of the procedure because that lateral nail fold is really important uh, for appearance and nail support. So our personal, my personal approach, and I work closely with Dr. Wall, is we create the dorsal commissural flap as described by Adrian Flat. Um, we create an apex, not a flat line at the volar suture area. We use hylomatrix. Uh, we have limited closure, meaning as few sutures as possible using a 5-0 vical repeat absorbing suture. We place a dressing for three weeks, and then we uh, get the patient moving as long as the wounds are all healing nicely. We do offer night splints or support in the first web space to minimize creep over time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alice. Uh, again, amazing talk. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Probably we can take the questions and then we can have a closing remarks uh, soon after that. Uh, there's a question to Dr. Wall, probably she's not there, and we have questions. Uh, in a newborn, how will you manage newborn with amniotic band and vascular compromise. Question uh, from uh, Dr. Jeremy. Dr. Trian, you want to answer or shall I? Yeah, please go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, new, I mean, newborn with vascular compromise, obviously that's something that needs to deal with. I mean, I'm assuming we're talking about like an amniotic band, which is immediately noticed after birth, which is constricting blood flow into the extremity. In which case that should be snipped at the bedside. We, I work at a teaching hospital where, I mean, this doesn't happen commonly, but when it does happen, uh, I mean, by the time I get into the hospital, it's usually already been snipped by one of our residents or fellows. It's a rare event, but that's, you know, an emergency, obviously. Um, there are other bands that don't necessarily cause arterial inflow issues, um, but they just cause swelling over a longer period of time. Those can be sort of excised on a more delayed basis. And that can be done with sort of reciprocating the plastics. Thank you. Uh, question to Dr. Goldfer from uh, Professor Anil, but uh, is regarding the use of uh, alno kappa wire for six months, is it buried at the elbow? Do you have any problems facing with the wire buried at the elbow? Um. Good question. Uh, we typically bury our pen from distally and place it between two metacarpal heads. And so that is where we leave it. We don't typically uh, approach it from proximally. It's all from distal. We bury the pen. And then when we come back to the operating room, we may you know, remove the pen. And so often that's for pulsization or treatment of the other side. I know some surgeons will leave the pens in indefinitely. But that's not our approach. Our goal is to try to get some motion. And so it's typically six months. And thankfully, migration is rare. It's interesting. We used to have a bigger problem with migration when we didn't use the pre-centralization distraction. But with the distraction, we get a better balance of wrist and there are less forces on the wrist. And I think that's why the pen tends to stay where we put it. And so we haven't lately had many problems, if any problems, with pen migration. Thank you. Uh, again, the same question to you from Dr. Anil, but uh, how often a radial anlage is seen? What is its role in patho anatomy and how do we excise it always? Do we excise it always? So, um, I, you know, the onlog is more notable for me with ulnar deficiency. And what I mean by that is uh, with radial deficiency, there rarely is anything there. With ulnar deficiency, you can have that cartilaginous onlog, which can be a tether and be a problem and may need to be excised. With radial deficiency, um, there, there rarely is a, a cartilage issue. Now, sometimes, as we all know, there's scar tissue. In TAR syndrome, 
there's been described a brachiocarpalis muscle uh, in TAR syndrome, which runs from above the elbow to the wrist. Um, and so that um, has to be excised as well in TAR syndrome. But a true onlog, in my experience, has been rare uh, in radial deficiency. Thank you. Not true. The question to all the panelists, uh, is there any role for uh, proximal phalanx to transfer in hypoplastic thumb 3B? Proximal phalanx transfer 3B. Yeah, so I think uh, I had sort of touched on a different version of that question earlier, but um, certainly in patients where there is a strong desire from the parents culturally to maintain five digits, then we will investigate reconstructive options for the 3B and 4. But in the absence of that, in my practice, typically I'm going to recommend an index finger pulsation for type 3B. And I... Um... I tried to put in my reference. I was asked about the paper that I mentioned with Dr. Kawabata, um, and I, I don't know if it came through clearly, but it was Journal of Hand Surgery. It actually was just in print this month, so January, Journal of Hand Surgery American. Um, and I think that's the point, is that sometimes with the three Bs, you need extra bony support, and that absolutely is an option. Uh, but I agree uh, with Dr. Trehan in that the United States rarely do we reconstruct those thumbs uh, but sometimes we do. And I will say also, in our country, the most difficult conversation with a family is the patient with a 3B thumb. Because there is a thumb, and they can see that thumb. And what we're telling them is, you don't want to keep that thumb. You want to polysize the index finger. And that's a really hard conversation. I don't know about Dr. Trehan, but what really helps me is pictures. And so I try to share pictures of previous thumbs uh, before and after surgery, and that can be really helpful in, t in convincing a family of the best approach, but ultimately we defer to their wishes. Thank you. Uh, another question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Dr. Jayan Chin, please go ahead. Yes, I have a question, um, Dr. Godfrey. Um, do you like uh, your uh, high, highly magical to Reconstruction is a defector, defect, defector of the release uh, uh, syntactory. So um, I wonder if this will, uh, this will, uh, the sky is a sphere. For, do, do you think the sky is a, the sky of the skin is uh, normal or less than the uh, skin, uh, skin graft? Thank you for the question. Um, I hope I, I hope I got it. I think I did. So the scarring and the color is excellent with Hilo Matrix, and so I've been very happy with the Hilo Matrix, um, and the patients have been very happy, even if it takes a little longer to heal. As I mentioned, that hypertrophic red tissue, which occasionally happens, and by occasionally I mean one out of twenty. Um, even those patients heal beautifully. And so I like it because it's easy, it's fast, it's inexpensive, and it provides a really good outcome. So I've been very, very happy with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Shija. She wants to know a, a protocol for the uh, reconstruction of Epic syndrome Preferably epic syndactyl hand. Is there any protocol where she wants to get glyphate? Um, sure, I can answer briefly. That's that, that's a a big a big question, as we all know. Um, for Apert's hands, um, I first of all try to create a hand with a thumb and all four fingers. There was a time when we talked about removing the index ray to create a better web space. We generally do not do that anymore. So you know, thumb and four fingers. Um, we create independent web spaces, but straight line incisions, which makes the surgery faster. Some have reported all web spaces being reconstructed at one surgery. So both hands, four web spaces at once. To me, that's too much surgery. And so I typically work with my partner, Dr. Wall. She has one hand, I have the other. We do two surgeries. So we separate half the webs on one surgery, the other half on another surgery. 
and we, we you know you get a hand that does this um but that can be very effective and you have to realign the thumb and the thumb proximal phalanx is often a delta phalanx but it um, you can provide a really good hand for those patients Thank you. Uh, probably the final question from the uh, audience. Do you apply a skin on the top of a dermal matrix at all? Um, no. So all we do, so we have the deficit area and we put the matrix, which has a silicone sheet on top of it. And we put that in with one or two stitches. That's it. And then we cover it all up. We see them back three weeks later. We peel off that silicone, which doesn't hurt. It's very easy. And often the skin is healed. If it's not healed, we do basic wound care for another week or two until it does heal. But no skin graft. So it's very different. Uh, so th these products were developed for burns. And so in the burn population, this is a temporizing uh, effect. And so you do have to go back and skin graft. In the, in the young child's hand, no skin graft is necessary. Thank you very much uh, for all your questions and the uh, responses. Uh, we are uh, uh, the, about to end this session. Before ending this, uh, we'll have quick 30 seconds closing remark from all the uh, panelists. Quick 30 seconds. Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Baskaran and sir. The closing remarks. I'm very happy that uh, things are covered very well, especially the modifications which uh, has done about. Uh, that syndactyl release, that flap, uh, it's fascinating that he's making a small V cut. And in fact, uh, hypoplastic thumb also, and the talk was excellent. And, uh, I, I, I really, uh, as, as, as a three, 3B is concerned, I still do uh, trap because a lot of mothers coax me. In our country, they don't want to part with the thumb. So I've done that and subsequently, Transfer of the abductor policies, abductor additional meat, and those thumbs are working. Work. Earlier, I also used to do for straight away polycization for 3D and A. Uh, my summary was excellent. And the other classification which she has thrown, that's also very good. In to totality, I say that this is good performance from everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. J, Dr. Jain, a uh, few uh, closing remarks, quick 30 seconds. No question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Trigan, your closing remarks and quick 30 seconds. Thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, as Dr. Goldfarb mentioned, I think this is a silver lining of this terrible pandemic that, you know, this uh, virtual platform bringing us all together uh, to talk about things we care deeply about and uh, these patients we care deeply about. I think this is only going to strengthen patient care in, in the future, uh, this sort of global connection and not waiting to have an annual conference to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Trigan. Uh, let me have five seconds of sharing and our screen uh, about the uh, our um, next uh, program. I mean, uh, It's not over. Anyway, uh, we have the uh, we have the next program uh, is about the humerus fractures, no palsy. So we have Dr. Asif Elias, uh, Peter Tang, and Dr. John Fuller. So we'll be uh, having our webinar uh, come uh, 30th, same again, uh, 7:30 p.m. in the uh, So. We'll have the final words from the uh, the we call the pioneer of the little hand problem. The goals for the probably wind up. I would just echo my thanks. It's always fun to talk about these differences. Uh, we all learn from one another, and um, I'm grateful for the global community in tackling these problems. And, and lastly, I would say I, I, I love this format. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. 
uh, with these panels. I think it's really great for you to sponsor and host these. It's really important uh, for the sharing of ideas. So I I'm grateful and I enjoyed this and uh, thank you guys. Yep. Thank you one and all. Uh, we have to leave here. Uh, I agree exactly on time. And uh, thank you one and all, Dr. Goldsweb, um, Charles, uh, Dr. Strahan, Dr. Lindley. Uh, unfortunately, we missed Dr. Brindley here, uh, Professor Baskar and sir, and all the attendees uh, who have been very active here. Thank you one and all. God bless you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Baskaran said, thank you, sir, for joining thank us. You, thank, you. thank you for giving me an opportunity. No, 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 sir. Yes, it's sir. Pleasure, pleasure having you. Next month, we'll be here listening to your talk, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Dr. Shen will be sharing a presentation about uh, her talk, and you will be speaking about the mirror hand. So I'll yes, send sir. you the invitation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Uh, you know, it's probably you. you're a little late there in China, so thank you for uh, sparing your uh, night with us. Thank you. Thank you.